As Ali talked about yesterday, there's been a, a slew um, of reports that are looking at the um, question of how brain development might inform um, policy on um, early child development. And these are just ones um, from the UK. Um, by no means is this um, list extensive. Um, every time I write something about this, somebody emails me from somewhere, typically Canada or New Zealand, and sends me yet another half a dozen reports that have come out of there. Um, yesterday, after I was on Women's Hour, for, it's done. Um, yeah, so yesterday, after I was on Women's Hour, um, somebody from Wales emailed me and said, you might not be aware there's a lot of Welsh documents also um, on this um, question. You really should read ours. So I now have a half a dozen Welsh documents to read. So they're, they're coming out um, constantly. This image here, um, I'm sure you're um, all now familiar with, not least because Ali showed it yesterday, a notorious image showing um, a normal brain and an extreme neglect brain and making the very um, crude um, but iconic um, representation that an intervention normal brain doesn't cost very much, um, but an extreme neglect brain costs <laughs> lots and lots of money. Um, I think when, when Nelly first invited me to give this talk, I actually wanted to give my talk entirely on um, the source and origin of this particular um, brain, but as able to find out so little about it, that's not actually possible. I have found out some things about it, though, and I'll share those with you um, later. All of, these policies, all of these documents are united by a series of beliefs, um, the first being, um, as John has explained, that the first three, or actually increasingly five years, um, are vital. Um, get it wrong in those first three to five years, and um, you're in trouble. And what they say is that what happens in these early years is written into the brain, so that every experience, every interaction, every serve and return, and what have you, is written into the brain. Do it wrong, and you get the wrong code going into the brain. Um, the child will lack empathy, lack the capacity to learn, and this will usher in a life of crime um, and poverty. So, for example, in this one, Alan and Smith argue that there's uh, sheer predictability of children's early years for their future outcomes. If a child is born into a home where they are nurtured, where conversation takes place, where someone reads to them, then, quite simply, their brain develops properly. It is in that delicate and vulnerable period, zero to three years, that our lives can be made or not. So pretty explicit, um, pretty dramatic um, interpretation of the data. Get it wrong, your life's over. Get it right, hey, you never know, you might have um, a good life. There's also something else I want to draw out of this, which I'll draw out through my talk, is that there's a, a very strong tendency in this literature to elide um, normal and abnormal. And here they're talking about fairly normal things, a place where conversation takes place, a place where someone reads to them. You know, these are not particularly abnormal things to happen. You would expect these things to happen in most homes. And as they're making the point that these fairly simple, mundane things can make or break um, a child. This, again, John spoke about this report. This does not come from the UK. This is from the Harvard um, um, Center on the Developing Child. Um, and the report argues that there have been exciting new developments in neuroscience that we must capitalize on to build a strong foundation for improved learning and behavior that will produce better outcomes in academic achievement, economic productivity, responsible citizenship, and successful parenting of the next generation. So the stakes are not low, um, according to the authors of these um, reports. And this is um, from um, the Science of Early Childhood website. Um, I do encourage you to go and look at this website. I'd be much meaner, um, actually, than John. These people, I don't know if this will work or not. No, probably not. There's a little um, video there that they up, up on their website. Um, and this group is very, very well organized, very slick, very technologically well informed. Um, their website is a blizzard um, of very nice looking reports with lots of pretty pictures in them. There's lots of video material embedded um, in their website. These people are very, very well connected in terms of the media. They're very, very well connected in terms of policy. I would be harsher than John. I'd say that they are, what they are not is scientists. They have given up on science. What they now are is advocates. They are no longer contributing um, original research material to the world, which is what most scientific institutions do. They are now advocating for a position that they have decided is correct, and they will accept no critique of that position. Um, they no longer critique themselves, and if you try and critique them, they will lambast you. So this is not a scientific initiative. It's kind of reminiscent of a few groups around autism who want to basically cure autism through all kinds of strange um, interventions, who produce lots and lots of scientific material or scientific sounding material and lots and lots of advocacy documents. The difference is that they often work out of their kitchen or their basement or out of their um, garage. These guys work out of Harvard, and uh, so they have a much more um, 
much more impressive um, machine than many other um, people in the grey part of science. But nevertheless, they are in that grey um, world. Okay, this is um, the early intervention one with the notorious um, brain on the front. Early intervention investment has the potential to make massive savings in public expenditure, reduce the cost of educational underachievement, drink and drug abuse, teenage pregnancy, vandalism, criminality, calls and police cops, <laughs> academic underachievement, lack of aspiration to work, and the bills from lifetimes wasted while claiming benefits. It's hard <laughs> to see anything that could possibly be more important and more influential um, than um, this early intervention that's been um, proposed. And given all of that, um, it's not surprising that all of these reports are united by the idea that educating parents about the early years is vital. Of course it's vital if every social ill and every problem that we face can be resolved in the early years. And so parents are going to need training um, to address um, early year needs. And in Parenting Matters, they make this quite explicit. What is required, in short, is a significant societal attitude shift akin to those involving seatbelt wearing and drink driving towards recognizing that parenting is something that has a societal aspect and importance about which it is socially acceptable for people to seek advice, learn, and approve. Parents who don't conform to what Parenting Matters views as good parents will be treated with the kind of moral opprobrium that we usually throw at people who drink and drive or people who refuse um, to wear um, a seatbelt. Okay, so let's have a look. What is the science um, behind um, these claims? And it's essentially two different groups of um, studies that are behind this. Um, case studies and group studies of severely abused infants, um, most n notoriously the infants that came out of the Romanian orphanages at the middle of the 1980s, end of the 1980s, and studies of animals chronically deprived of sensory input, studies that were bega began in the 90, late 1950s and were continued through the 60s and 70s, are essentially the bedrock um, of the claims for early intervention. So let's look at a couple of case studies um, by Dr. Bruce Perry, who John also mentioned. Um, I've looked very hard at um, Bruce Perry's um, life over the last few weeks. I've come to hate Bruce Perry with a, a true, true passion. Um, he, he is one of the um, Harvard scientists um, who no longer does science, as far as I can tell. Um, he is engaged purely in advocacy. He um, was the guy behind this picture, um, which appeared in the Newsweek of 1996, which again, um, John referred to. Um, what the picture shows is the brain, uh, this is a PET scan, a positron emission tomography scan, of a normal um, healthy brain, and you can see there's red, green blobs here. And this is a, a scan of a not healthy brain, an abused brain, and you can see that the red and green blobs are missing. And the claim was made um, was that an abused brain functionally affects your brain um, and stops you thinking and remembering and being, you know, basically undermines your cognitive capacity. It was one case, one subject, uh, one normal subject, one um, abuse subject, and it appeared um, in Newsweek, and it was given to Newsweek um, by Bruce Perry. Now, to some extent, I can forgive that. You know, I get asked all the time by the media for images and things that, that represent my work, and sometimes you will give a case study that represents your work, but I don't think what Bruce did was um, forgivable, which I'll explain in a moment. Bruce is also um, the source of the notorious um, normal brain and extreme neglect brain. Um, it appeared first in an abstract for a, pre for a poster that was presented at the Society for Neuroscience Conference, um, I think in 1996, um, something like that, over um, 10 years ago. And then it appeared again um, in this paper, um, which Ali um, referenced yesterday in, in 2002, and this is where um, the picture um, has come from. I emailed Bruce and I said, I don't know if you're aware, um, but your picture of a normal child and an extreme neglect child is cropping up all over the place in many, many policy circles here and abroad. And can you tell me anything more about it? Like, where did it come from? Whose brain is it? That kind of thing. And he emailed me back and he said, ah, yes, um, that brain does crop up quite a lot. Um, it was part of a large um, group study um, that began in the early 1990s and which we're preparing for publication, and um, that was it. Now, I kind of don't believe him. Um, I believe that there was um, a group study planned in the early 1990s, but even the most complicated of group studies of this kind don't take 20 years to complete. I don't think the group study is ever going to come out. I think what he got out of it were a few very compelling um, images which is used um, for um, chapters, review papers, and for media presentations. 
But there's also something even more pernicious about that, uh, about this particular picture. It gives you the idea um, that a normal child has a, a big brain and a child that's neglected has a small brain. And when you look at that, you think, okay, so well, you know, psychological neglect leads to your brain not developing properly. And actually, that's the wrong conclusion to draw. Um, these kids that Bruce was studying came out of um, Romanian orphanages where they weren't just psychologically neglected, they were physically neglected. They were starving, um, and they had no medical attention whatsoever. They spent most of their early years in a state of ill health. And if you starve and neglect a child in that manner, then their brain will not grow. And it's a simple physical fact. It's not an expression of their psychological um, um, neglect. It's an expression of their physical um, neglect. Malnourishment will means that your brain won't grow. Okay, so there have been more serious studies done, um, mostly by um, um, Shigani um, in the States and by Michael Rutter over here in the UK. I've done a series of studies um, of the child children that are coming out of um, these institutionalized um, conditions. And this is just one example um, from that work. And what you're looking at here is white matter connections um, colorized in red um, in the brain. You don't need to know any details about that. Um, all you need to notice is that in the normal child, you get a nice healthy um, or supposedly healthy um, connection of white matter, and in the um, severely deprived child, um, that um, connection is thinned out. You might look at the other side of the brain and say, well, hang on, it looks okay on that side. In fact, the brain looks thinner in the normal child, but let's ignore that. Okay, let's just <laughs> take it at face value, um, that there is a statistically significant difference here um, in the severely um, deprived um, child, and that that's a real finding that may have implications for how this child's brain um, works. There's also a, a lot of work not looking just at the structure of the brain, but at the functionality of the brain. So these are children who are nine years of age, who were placed into a Romanian orphanage by about six weeks of age for a mean duration of 38 months before they were adopted um, into um, Western families. And they're compared now with a control group of non-institutionalized infants. And the red blobs are areas of the brain that are more active um, in the normal children compared to the institutionalized children and there's reduced um, glucose metabolism, reduced brain activity in and around um, the area of the hippocampus, which is an important area for memory. And so the memory deficits and problems that these children have um, may be down in part to reduced um, ability of this part of the brain to work appropriately as a consequence of the institutionalization. So that, that's fine, and that makes um, a reasonable amount of sense. There's also, as John mentioned, a, a large number of behavioral studies that have been performed as well. Um, again, looking at um, the consequence of institutionalization, um, these are the mean scores on a battery of different um, assessments of um, cognition and sensory processing. 100 would be normal, and children that are placed into an orphanage for a mean duration of 29 months um, are scoring below normal on all um, of these um, particular um, measures. They're not, as it happens, scoring severely lower. Um, only impulsivity comes out as being um, more than a standard deviation below um, the norm, but they do have some global, clear global impairment as a consequence of their institutionalization. So to summarize this first part of the evidence, um, infants that are placed in a severely deprived environment, mostly kids in Romanian orphanages, but also kids in um, Chinese orphanages and other orphanages in Korea, um, for the first three years of life, do have changes in brain connectivity, they do have changes in function, and they do have reduced cognitive ability and increased behavioral problems such as impulsivity at the age of nine after they've been pulled out of the orphanages. So that's the first um, set of data. So the second set of data, uh, which relates um, to the, the idea that there are critical periods um, in development where you have to have certain kinds of input in order for your brain to develop properly, um, is based on largely on animal studies. So in the 1950s and 60s, Hubel and Wiesel, who won the Nobel Prize for this, um, started to stitch up um, the eyelids of um, kittens. Why did they do this? They did this not because they were perversely um, uh, just hated kittens. Um, they did this because kids, it was discovered once we were able to remove cataracts, that kids born with cataracts, um, if, even if you removed them um, when they were you know, six, seven, or uh, later in life, were remained blind. They could not see. So kids born with cataracts never were able to see, even though the um, cataracts were removed later in life. And Hubel and Wiesel wanted to know what is the basis of this problem? Why um, does this happen? 
So they began sewing up the eyes of, of kittens and measuring cortical activity in, in visual cortex um, after um, they've sewed up um, the eye. And here you're looking at normal um, cortical activity. Um, it's spread over both sides. Um, here you're looking at uh, a kitten that's been monocularly deprived, that is it's had its eyelid sutured closed from birth. Um, and you can see there's a very dramatic shift um, in the um, pattern of activity. Um, essentially, activity associated with this eye is completely gone. Um, if you do um, the suturing in a mature adult cat, you get a reduction in overall activity, but the pattern remains um, essentially the same. So the reason why um, kids who are born with cataracts end up functionally blind is not because their eyes end up broken, the eyes still work appropriately when you take out the cataract, it's because their brain no longer works appropriately. The areas associated with visual processing have shut down. They no longer function in response to information coming from that eye. If you don't get information from the eye in the first um, three months of life or, or thereabouts, then you will never um, be able to see um, out of that eye. And so this gives ideas, the idea that there are critical periods. So um, in further studies, human research have demonstrated that just three days of monocular deprivation before one month of age causes a shift in the course of innovation to favor the non-deprived eye, and that shift um, is irreversible. So this is the, where the idea of critical periods comes from. If you don't have appropriate visual input during that period, um, then um, you, will never, uh, you will never see properly um, again. This is all fascinating. I think neuroscientists are doing good work. I think it's very interesting to look at what happens when you come out of Romanian orphanages. I think it's interesting to work out how the sensory systems work and when and where they use um, appropriate um, sensory input. Extrapolation from these particular situations to the normal, however, is, I've put on the slide, unwarranted. It's utterly stupid. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> There's nothing surprising about the fact that infants who spend 23 plus hours a day in isolation have learning and behavioral problems. It would be amazing if that wasn't true. Can you imagine <laughs> locking a child up for the first three years of its life um, and only visiting it for half an hour a day to give it some gruel is going to be, you know, um, not result in behavioral and learning problems. And to some extent, the scientists who, who, and the non-scientists who write about this do recognize this problem. And what they do is they, they do a clever little trick. They elide the normal and the abnormal. So in the paper that Bruce Perry has, that picture of the extreme neglect brain, um, he writes about overt childhood abuse. He writes about the experiences of kids in, um, raised in orphanages, institutionalized in these kind of um, ab 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 abhorrent conditions. And then he says... <coughs> Recent inadvertent impacts of technology have spawned declines in extended families, family meals, and spontaneous peer interactions. And just like that, Bruce has now equated spending 23 plus hours in a crib on your own with missing a family meal, as if they're kind of the same thing, as if they kind of belong on the same um, spectrum. And of course, they just don't. Um, Living in those kinds of conditions, starving, diseased, not attended to, frankly abused, and living in these kind of neglectful, apparently, um, conditions um, is not the slightest bit um, comparable. Um, being caged in a crib all day is not the same as missing a family meal. It's not the same even as being ignored. It's not the same as benign neglect. These things are very, very different, and you don't need to be a scientist um, to tell the difference although maybe you should not be a neuroscientist. <laughs> so typical families don't isolate their children for 23-plus hours a day. And also, they don't tend to soak their children's <laughs> eyelids. They don't block their ears with, with candle wax. Um, they, don't, you know, they don't silence them. They don't gag them. They don't lock them in a cu cupboard. They don't hit them with a frying pan. They don't do any of these things. So these um, case studies and group studies of severely neglected children and the studies of, of animals are irrelevant um, to what is normal um, family life. And it is simply incorrect and dishonest to imply that if severe neglect causes a larger problem, lesser neglect um, will cause a lesser um, problem. And let me illustrate why I think that's true. So I think normal family interactions are good enough. And there's no evidence, none that I've been able to find, that an enriched environment improves um, childhood um, outcome. So there's not a lot of evidence on this because um, null findings don't generally get reported. So you have to 
work it out by um, divining it from um, the things that researchers say and don't say. So there's been a series of studies performed by um, Anne Diamond and Goldman McCreish. Goldman McCreish, unfortunately, um, was hit by a car about 15 years ago and uh, passed away, but um, Diamond is still with us, and they've, she's continued this work. And they did a lot of work um, on human memory and also on primate memory. And they're particularly interested in the ability to hold in memory a something for a period of time. Um, and in order to study this, they use what's called um, the delayed response task, and it measures the emergence of representational memory. And in the typical human-infant interaction, what you'll have is a, an experimenter here um, who will put something interesting under one of two cups. You can only see one cup. There's another cup um, behind her, her arm. And then um, the experimenter will very meanly hide the two cups and engage the infant um, for a period of time, one second, two seconds, three seconds, five, 10, 15, and so on. And the task, once you remove the, um, the uh, barrier, is to see whether or not the infant can pick up the correct cup and grab the tasty treat or whatever it was that the experimenter <laughs> hid behind um, the cup. Very young infants, a delay of one second, and they forget. Um, as the infant gets older, longer and longer delays, um, and, uh, and the infant can um, find where the, um, where the tasty treat is. It's been demonstrated through a series of studies that I won't bore you with that this ability of representational memory is dependent upon the development of dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is this bit of brain um, here. Um, as that part of the brain develops, so our ability to hold in memory um, improves, and we can um, hold in memory things for longer and longer periods. The key point is, is that Diamond and, and Goldman Rakesh have done, did this experiment many, many times with a group of infants. And what they reported, and this was an incidental finding, this wasn't what they were interested in, but they report that if you repeat tests with the delayed response, you don't get much gain. That is, the infants don't get much better. You get a gain of about one or two seconds in the first 12 months. So um, rather than the child not being able to remember after um, four seconds, they may be able to remember um, four to six seconds and then forget after six seconds. Um, after 12 months, however, even that advantage um, disappears. So there's a tiny advantage of this repeat testing, if this enriched environment, if you like, in the first year, um, but then that, even that tiny advantage um, disappears. And what they argue is that memory develops approximately the same rate, regardless of any um, enrichment um, that you might provide. So that's memory. Um, Patricia Cool has done an enormous amount of work on language development. Um, and she's particularly interested in phoneme discrimination. What are phonemes? Well, probably most of you know what phonemes are now, phonics being so, um, <laughs> such a big buzzword. But phonemes are things like l, r, k, and so forth. And phonemes are very, very important in language. So one of the reasons why the Japanese struggle to say hello appropriately, they'll say haro, um, is because in Japanese, r and l um, don't exist. There's no separate r, l phoneme in Japanese. And so they can't really hear r, l distinctions. They really struggle with those distinctions. So when they're saying haro, it sounds the same to them as when they're saying hello. When you say hello to them, they hear haro um, because they don't have that phoneme distinction in their language. And what Patricia Cooler's reports is that at, at birth, um, newborns can discriminate all the phonemes um, that are out there um, in the world. But by the time they get to 10 months, they start to readily respond just to the phonemes that are particular to their native language. In other words, they're starting to extract from the world around them the relevant um, phonemes that are important for the language that they are going um, to speak. And she's also reported that the critical requirement for phoneme recognition is the shared perception of communicative intent, um, which is a posh way of saying talking. Um, basically, interacting with your um, infant um, in a direct communicative manner. And she points out that television um, is no good. Um, all those parents who are showing your kids um, French TV shows and Japanese TV shows, Chinese TV shows, give it up. It's not going to work. Um, it makes no difference. However, how much talking a day is enough? Well, Patricia Cool says, you know, one to two hours a day um, is enough. And she's reported that there's no evidence that flashcards at three months of age or any other types of enrichment provide any advantage. And again, unless you're living in a Romanian orphanage and being locked in your crib for 23 hours a day, then you are going to have somebody um, who speaks to you for one or two hours um, a day. Even modern daycare ain't that bad. 
And then another source of um, information on this has come from this conference, actually. Uh, uh, Dr. Hartis yesterday presented a paper um, on um, the Millennium Project, which I wasn't um, familiar with. Um, and she reported that reading to a child every day versus once a week made no difference to teacher ratings of literacy, reading, communication, and so on at Key Stage 1, that is at age 7. So parents who reported that they read to their child every day from birth um, versus parents who reported that they only read to their child, uh, their infant, once a week. Um, by the time you got to Key Stage 1, age 7, teachers couldn't tell the difference between those two um, groups of kids. They were performing um, at the same level in terms of literacy, reading, communication, and so on. So, Severe deprivation causes problems. What a surprise. Normal family interactions are not um, comparable. Even beyond that, though, um, what the, these reports also miss out is that deprivation can be overcome. They are deeply, deeply pessimistic, these reports, and inappropriately so. Even for kids coming out of um, Romanian orphanages, all is not lost. So at adoption, um, when these kids were first brought out, 70 to 90 percent, depending on which report you read, um, have a severe deprivation. They have global <coughs> impairment in their cognitive um, function. But a few years after adoption, and the report unfortunately doesn't specify how many years, but I'm guessing about five to six years after, that figure drops to between 14 and 36 percent. So even in the worst case scenario, you're talking about um, something like half the children um, um, having um, uh, going from having global impairment to not having global impairment, which is pretty um, dramatic. This is one case study, Lex, um, who came to England, I think, when he was seven years old. Um, he's now um, an adult, um, feels English. He works as a, an, an ambulance driver, I believe, um, and has a, a pretty normal um, life. And yet he was one of those kids that had global impairment when he came out of Romania. I'm not saying it's, 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 it's a doddle. Um, it is, you know, it's not a picnic. Um, some of these kids do have um, severe problems going forward, but dramatic improvements have been recorded. And these improvements have been recorded just by putting the kids into essentially normal, typical British and American families. We have no idea what we might be able to achieve if we actually tried to provide them with um, a, more, um, a more appropriate intervention that was tailored more directly to the problems um, that they face. So this is just taking these kids, tossing them into a better environment, um, and at least 50% of them um, show some um, quite dramatic improvements. So again, this, this idea that you can take what happens to severely deprived kids and apply it to um, deprived children. Um, so the, in the um, Parenting Matters paper, and lots and lots of these different papers, they point out that kids from um, lower socioeconomic status hear a large, uh, a much smaller number of words in any given um, time period than do um, kids from um, um, working class or professional um, families. And they argue that you will never be able to catch up um, from that deprivation. But that's um, not true. Um, some children do hear fewer words, but you can address this um, at any time. Um, as long as they are exposed to language, then there's no reason why at a later time in their life they can't make up um, for the deficits um, in their exposure to words earlier in their life. They can at any time choose to pick up books and start reading. There is no time limit on the point when you can start to become more um, literate. I don't think I started reading properly really until I was about 25 years old, so there you go. <laughs> Anyone can make positive change in their life. You can learn a new language, you can work abroad, you can volunteer, you, and that through these activities you can discover aptitudes and skills that you, you never had before. It doesn't matter what happens in the first year of life, there are always opportunities and possibilities for um, further development. In fact, um, it's been argued um, by Judith Harris that parents might not even matter um, very much, that the biggest influence in kids' lives um, is um, their peers and their life after they leave the home at the end of their three years. So the children of deaf parents, for example, manage to learn how to speak as well as those whose parents speak to them um, from day one. And the children of immigrants learn the local language and almost never retain the accent um, of their parents, despite in their early years being exposed um, to their parents' language and their parents' accent, and uh, not so much to the um, language outside. Parental variability, so anxious parents, carefree parents, lots of reading to almost no reading, permissive to authoritarian, and so on, is not actually a useful guide for how um, a child will turn out. And this is summarized in Judith Harris's paper and in her book, 
um, Nurturing Matters, I think the book was called. Um, she points out that all of these different variables in parental approaches and attitudes have almost no impact on how um, your child um, will turn out. She draws the conclusion that it's all genetics, which I think is also wrong, but um, I think she gets the parental variability thing right. So what's happening here is actually not, not a use of science, but an abuse of science. Um, it is the case that children who grow up relatively deprived, with little access to books and poor schooling, are not comparable to children from remaining orphanages or to animals completely denied sensory input. And anybody who tries to draw that comparison is not being scientific. They're abusing science. They're not um, using science. Anybody who tells you that typical inadequacies of early years can't be addressed later in life is equally um, not um, using the science. And what this means is that if somebody does disappear into antisocial behavior, crime, educational failure, poverty, or whatever, um, you can't explain that away as the inevitable consequences of irreparable brain damage caused by early years deprivation. The foundational point that Alan, Ian Duncan Smith, and others want to make, which is that this, in the three years, the first three years of life, the interventions we make can solve all these problems, is simply incorrect. And the opposite point that if we have crime, educational failure, and so on and forth, it's because of the first five years and there's nothing we can do about it, is also um, incorrect. Which makes the um, demands, um, increasingly shrill and increasingly authoritarian demands from this lobby, um, much, much more hard to swallow. So this is the um, Parenting Matters. They have five commandments for what you should do with your children, um, five a day for development. They're modeling it over the five a day fruit and veg campaign. Um, one, read to your child for 15 minutes. Two, play with your child on the floor for 10 minutes. Three, talk with your child for 20 minutes with the television off. Four, adopt positive attitudes towards your child and praise them frequently. Five, give your child a nutritious diet to aid development. There's no evidence, none, that this will make any particular difference to any child. Um, and anybody who tells you differently is not um, being straight. But there are more problems than just this not being, you know, an honest enterprise. I think th this focus on what parents do further isolates parents. Uh, it puts more and more pressure on parents, throws them back more and more onto their own resources, makes bringing up a child like their own personal Alamo. You know, it's a make or break thing. It's a now or never. It's a do or die um, operation. It also just disrupts normal family life. So you might think, and that you have a family meal because it's an enjoyable activity, and that's what we do on Thursdays. But no, you have a family meal so that you grow your child's neurons and so that you teach them how to have empathy and so on and so forth. And so parenting becomes an instrumentalized thing, and it makes it harder for parents to trust their own instincts about what they should and shouldn't do. It also, I think, starts to undermine adult responsibility. If we take this message seriously, um, then everything that you do from five years on is not your fault. Um, it doesn't matter if you go and kick a shop window in and steal a television, or, well, maybe it does matter, but it's not your fault because the reason you've done that is because you didn't get the appropriate intervention um, when you were zero to five years old. That's why you're committing that particular um, act. So it undermines um, the responsibility that we should all take um, for the lives um, that we lead because we can always blame it on the decisions that our parents made um, when we were not yet five years old. And it also, of course, invites an authoritarian intervention into what families do. So politicians are given um, a green light to go ahead and tell us how we should organize our family meals, how we should organize bedtime reading, how we should organize TV time, and so on and so forth. An unprecedented access to our front rooms, our kitchens, and our bedrooms because the stakes are um, according to them, so um, high. Okay, so just in conclusion, it is the case that severe deprivation has negative consequences, but that doesn't tell us anything about typical developments. Um, you cannot draw a line from the severe to the typical. And science, and this is a point that just kind of came to me when I was stood in the shower or something. It's like, even if you know, the science was a bit more solid, it would still not make parenting a scientific project. Science can't guide parenting because the science is not good enough. We do need better science. But it's not just that. Um, parenting is not a science project. If you're looking to science to address the problems of parenting, you're looking in the wrong place. That's not where the answers are going to lie. It's not just that the science is wrong and not good enough. It's that using science is uh, just a wrong-headed approach. 
Attempts to guide parenting are an authoritarian effort to impose our middle class parenting practices, I would say. And that's it. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>